Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. Corey and Chad here chatting with Kenton Ralph Toes, founder of Yusha Crypto. Kenton, we are going to focus a lot on the Bitcoin ETF and your insights or outlook into any potential approvals in the new year. But first, let's just recap what Bitcoin did this year even going back to 2022, because look, this year, Bitcoin did really well. It entered the year around 16,000 and moved the whole way up to about 42,000 right now. But if you look back to 2022, well, Bitcoin entered 2022 at about 48,000. So it's been a two-year almost roundabout trip here. And this year, we have seen some good leverage provided by some of the miners, some of the smaller coins What's your outlook for Bitcoin, for cryptocurrencies moving into next year after, again, a bad 2022, very good 2023? What does 2024 hold? Sure. Hi, Corey. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, let's we'll start. Let's go back to 2022. It's actually pretty interesting for me because around March, April, that time, I remember looking at the price thinking, okay, you know, we've had two big pullbacks in Bitcoin. If we go back even further to, to 2021, you know, it ran up to 60 some grand, down to 30, back up to 60 some grand, down to 30, and then came up to 40. So I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe we're gonna hold, this 40 grand level will hold. And then Luna happened. And that's when, you know, Luna blew up, it went to zero. Luna and UST, two of the top cryptocurrencies in the sector went, went to zero within a few days. And then when that happened, it exposed all the scams, all the frauds, all the leverage traders, everything, everything blew up. And then that's what really caused the bear market in, in 2022. And then that that culminated with um, FTX blowing up and, and Sam Bankman freed fraud, right? It was an ugly year, 2022, but I mean, it's quite literally everything you want to see to mark a bottom in, in a market, you know, and you have all those things failing, all those zeros. You know, the unfortunate, all those losses, that's what you see at market bottoms, right? It sucks. It was painful to go through, but long term, it's actually really good for the sector because had those frauds, had those scams, like, oh, let me rephrase this. Had Luna not blown up like that, all those frauds and scams would still exist today and they'd be, be getting bigger and bigger. And only for the eventual demise, you know, some point down the road. So it was good to get flush that out, get it out of the way. And because what that does is it sets the stage for us to truly grow and succeed. And only you know, the legitimate players and legitimate stuff will grow and thrive from here. And that's what I think we've seen here in this 2023. We got rid of a lot of the bad actors, a lot of the fluff, a lot of the leverage. And we started 2023 without any of that. And that's why Bitcoin is back up. That's why crypto is back up. You know, we're setting the stage here to start performing again. So looking into 2024, I think we're going to see more of what we saw this past year. I'm really looking forward to, to the, you know, see what Bitcoin, all the rest of the crypto does, especially the altcoins. They're, you know, Bitcoin has been, you know, it leads the sector, right? It's been performing well in, in 2023. The altcoins are just starting to get going too. And, you know, they always tend to outperform Bitcoin. So um, I think 2024 will be a great year for the altcoins as well. Well, Kenton, just to that point, it kind of reminds me of forest management where you kind of get rid of the underbrush, you get rid of some of the weeds and some of the bushes that are choking out the good trees so that you're left with a better forest and less likely to have the whole place burned down to the ground. So I think it is good to clear house once in a while, to your point. And 2023 was a year where you really had most of that in the rearview mirror and things were trucking forward. But I do wonder how much of the recent move up in the cryptocurrency space is because of either the anticipation of these ETFs that could get approved, but also a general rally in everything, a rally in the markets, a rally in commodities, you know, the, the Fed getting near the end of their rate hiking cycle. How much of it was macro or anywhere? It was just a sugar high rally in everything. And how much of it is the anticipation of these crypto ETFs? Yeah, great, great question. I think the answer to all that is yes. I think it's a combination of everything. Definitely the macro headwinds, right? It's not not just Bitcoin is up. Everything's up over the last few months, right? I just read an interesting stat. Like the Russell 2000 went from 52-week lows to 52-week highs 
in the shortest time frame ever, or the only other time that it happened was like in the 70s or something like that. So yeah, everything's had a bid over the last few months. You know, I think the market is sniffing out interest rates going down and, and QE coming back. If we look more specifically at, at Bitcoin, I'm inclined to think since August, like that performance from like 25 grand up to here to 42 grand, I think a lot of that run is, has been pushed based on the um, anticipation of Bitcoin ETF. I, I think the market is getting more more confident or believe it's going to happen here soon. And I'm reading all kinds of rumors and stuff that it could happen as early as the first week of January. The next, the SEC, the next deadline they have is January 10th. They have to make a decision on on Kathy Wood's ARC Invest, her Bitcoin ETF. It's interesting because the ARC, one of the ARC funds, it owned Grayscale, GBTC, that, that Bitcoin product trust, if you will. I mean, they're, they're, Grayscale is trying to become an ETF as well. But ARC and one of their funds owned GBTC as their Bitcoin exposure. But ARC just sold all their GBTC shares uh, like yesterday. And they rolled that money into BITO, B-I-T-O, the Bitcoin Futures ETF. So, you know, everyone's kind of speculating, wondering, okay, well, maybe they sold, they had to sell their GBTC shares because it's a competing ETF. You know, they don't want to, you know, give any kind of wrong ideas or anything like that. And so they're parking the cash in the Futures ETF for the time being. So that when their ETF gets approved, they roll that, oh, they roll that cash into their own ARC Bitcoin ETF. And I'm, I'm totally, totally speculating here, right? Just because they made that move doesn't mean, you know, for sure it's going to happen, that their ETF is going to get approved first or right away. But that's what we can do as investors, right? We can, you know, try and read the tea leaves. I'm also wondering, will the SEC approve one of these ETFs at a time or all of them at once? Because obviously whoever gets approved first is going to have first mover advantage, right? If the SEC is trying to create an equal playing field for all participants, in theory, then you think they're going to approve all of them at once. It'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see how January plays out. It's not just, so January 10th is the first deadline, and there's several other deadlines throughout the month. If all of those get extended, then after that will be, will be March, and March is the final deadline. I'm inclined to think we're going to get approval here in the first quarter of next year. Okay, so who knows if we do get approval, but let's let's play the game here where approval does happen. And there are ETFs more available to investors that want exposure to Bitcoin. We've seen this happen in many, many other sectors where ETFs are introduced and we've seen uh, many different outcomes. So how do you see ETFs impacting either positively or negatively the overall Bitcoin market? But then also, let's drive down into some of the miners, some of the other available investments that investors can make on trusted exchanges. How do ETFs change the landscape for investors? We chatted about this a bit offline. The gold ETF, GLD, that did have an impact on gold miners. Because before GLD, there's no real way for an institutional investor to, to get exposure to gold. Um, like not directly. They'd have to buy the gold miners indirectly. And with GLD coming out, I didn't have to do it anymore. They could actually buy GLD. And so after GLD came out, gold miners started trading at lower multiples than they had previously. And so I think the same thing is going to happen here. Bitcoin ETF and Bitcoin miners, uh, MicroStrategy, you know, any of these kind of Bitcoin proxy plays, the money, the people were looking for, for Bitcoin exposure and stocks, they have their ETF now. They're going to go to the ETF. And, and you get a, you get a, I think it's going to have a pretty big impact in general because, you know, if you look at, I mean, I, I deal with all day long trying to get people to buy Bitcoin, right? And their heads just implode, you know, their brains just shut down. Even though it's actually now, it's actually very simple. Like you just open an account at Coinbase or Kraken or whatever, wire in some money and you buy it. It's no different than opening a stock brokerage account, wiring in some money and buying a stock. But you know, most people just, for some reason, they can't get over that mental hurdle. But those people who are stuck getting over that hurdle, they already have bro stock brokerage accounts. They have an account interactive broker at E-Trade, at RBC Capital Markets, TDs, Scotia Bank, whatever. They've had that account for 10, 20, 30 years. They know how to use it. Um, they're comfortable with it. Now they have a way to buy Bitcoin in that account. 
They don't have to go open a new account at Coinbase. They can do it right in their brokerage account. And I guarantee you that is holding some people back. Also, just regular investment managers. They're not allowed to buy uh, pink sheet stocks. Like they can't buy Grayscale's GBTC, even if they wanted to. So having the New York Stock Exchange listed ETF, they'll be able to buy it. And that's why I think like the Bitcoin miners and, and MicroStrategy, like those share prices, uh, they've been volatile, but they've also had some great gains. It's because people have been buying them because they really have no other way to get exposure to Bitcoin. They've just been buying them in, in lieu of Bitcoin because, you know, they're not buying Bitcoin directly. Um, that's the only way they can do it. And so with the Bitcoin ETF coming out, it really solves a big problem for them. So, yeah, I think it's going to attract money here from, from all corners of the market. I don't think it's priced in at all. I think it's going to attract a lot of new money, especially to... You know, people might just be waiting because, you know, people do actually, some people actually believe in the SEC. They actually believe in regulators that are actually, they actually think regulators are helping them. And if the SEC approves it and starts trading, that'll be their signal, their sign that, okay, you know, Big Brother says this is okay. All right, now I'm comfortable. I'm going to buy it. Whereas none of those people have bought previously, right? They don't have exposure previously. So I think we're going to see a new wave of buying into the ETF and that'll, that'll drive the Bitcoin price up. Well, Kenton, just one follow-up on the crypto miners. Yes, I think a lot of funds and a lot of investors access those because they have big board listings and because they have traded on exchanges that they trust, that just like their normal equity market, so it's easier for them to be positioned. But wouldn't you say there's also still a component of the crypto miners where people are trying to get leverage to the actual movements in the coins themselves because there's a lot of people just like in the gold space you could buy gold but it's really more of a uh, of a store of value like bitcoin is whereas a gold mining stock is really a play on the volatility around the pricing and a play on the leverage don't you still think that there still will be a place for the crypto miners for people that want that leverage that the miners give to the underlying coins just like commodities miners give to the underlying commodities i'm not no way am i trying to say that bitcoin miners can go to zero or anything like that you're absolutely right. They'll still be around. There'll still be people looking to play that, looking for leverage. I wouldn't be surprised if the if the rallies going forward are more subdued, because you know over the you know, even just up to two years ago, you know, there's some of the only only plays, only ways to buy get exposure to Bitcoin through your brokerage account. You know, as the markets grow and mature, there's more and more ways to get exposure to Bitcoin. And through a brokerage account and that money's going to get spread out over all these different plays. So, um, yeah, you'll definitely still have your leverage in the Bitcoin miners. They'll still be around. And I, I just, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I just wouldn't be surprised if the volatility is less. I'm more than happy to be wrong, but yeah, I just, I wouldn't be surprised if, if more money goes towards the, the more stable Bitcoin ETF instead of, instead of being in that leverage. If we do get a Bitcoin ETF, what do you think it does for all these other cryptocurrencies? The wide, big world of uh, other currencies that trade, again, as more leverage to Bitcoin, usually. Yeah, they're going to go up. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, gold and gold stocks, right? We need the gold price to go up to get gold stocks going. Even though, you know, an expiration, a gold expiration company technically has no, no leverage of the gold price because they don't own it. They don't have any gold, right? So it, this price shouldn't go up because the gold price goes up, uh, but they do. Same thing in crypto. You know, you're going to have, you know, Bitcoin leads the sector. Bitcoin's going up, making all, you know, new highs and everyone's, everyone's excited. Other cryptos are going to fall along, even though they have, you know, there's really zero correlation between it and Bitcoin, um, you know, fundamentally. But um, practically, it's going to happen, right? And, you know, people will take profits in Bitcoin, go buy smaller stuff. Uh, people borrow against their Bitcoin, go buy smaller stuff. You know, Bitcoin's going up in price, making all-time highs. I was going to see, oh, Bitcoin's at, at uh, seventy-five thousand dollars. That's that's way too expensive. I want a token that's seven cents, right? And that is the way people think. So, yeah, you're going to see the rest of the sector perform for sure. All right. Well, Kenton, we'll look ahead to next year, and boy, oh boy, again, so much attention on. The Bitcoin ETF, my takeaway is usually when we see an ETF launched, it does bring in some initial buying. But then the question is, does it continue? And 
does it sometimes mark a top after that rush in? But we've already seen a nice bounce in cryptocurrencies. It has gone along with a market rebound throughout the year. But one thing for sure, it seems like Bitcoin is continuing to be that volatility that a number of investors look for. Maybe that'll dissipate as well when an ETF is approved. But again, who knows? It's been a very interesting and quite frankly, fun market to follow along with because of that volatility and because of all the other coins that are out there as well. Ken, thank you for your time this year sharing uh, your outlook on the crypto space. We will continue to chat with you in 2024. I hope you have a very happy new year. Thank you, Corey. You too.